tithes and we give our offerings. Some of you do not understand what a tithe is. Very seldom do I speak on finances, but a tithe is a 10% of how God has blessed you with. The Bible tells us very clearly uh, in the book of uh, Malachi that when we begin to, that is the only scripture where God challenges us and says, challenge me, test me now. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And I can personally testify, you can never, ever outgive God. You can never outgive God. Challenge Him. Say, God, okay, like if you have never done it before, say, okay, God, you know I'm going through a very tough time, but I'm going to challenge you on this one. Can I hear an amen? God's not afraid to be challenged because He'll prove you. He says, I will prove you that I am true to my word. Amen. All right, so you want to give towards missions, your offerings, whatever it is. You know, we just thank God for your faithfulness. We have been able to touch different nations as well. Father, we are so grateful to you. Your, your word clearly tells us, Lord, that all good gifts come from the Father above. That you give us the capacity, the ability, the power to make wealth. So, Lord, we want to acknowledge that it is you who gives us the strength, the jobs that we have. Sometimes we're not very happy with what we do have. But, God, we know that you provide for us. Your word clearly tells us that you will give us work if anyone here does not have a job. Your word clearly tells us, Lord, if a man does not work, he, should, he, he is not supposed to, to enjoy all the other stuff. So, Lord, I, I just ask now for those who need a job since you said that in your word provide them jobs i mean provide them good jobs father because you are a good god and good gifts come from your presence so lord bless your people bless them with their businesses give them good business good success because all good things come from you so god bless them we pray with good things and we vow at the end of the day we will stand, lift up our hands, and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. You know, some years ago, Dr. Yong Yi Cho was uh, in France. This is the French pastor who told me this. He was the interpreter, uh, Samuel Rains. <laughs> he was interpreting for... Uh, Dr. Yong Yi Cho, and they were sitting on the platform. And of course, you know, in big meetings, you got a lot of people saying a lot of stuff and all of that. And so he was sitting there, he didn't understand because it was all in French. And so the guy got up and he began to talk and uh, talk, talk, talk for some time. And so Yong Yi Cho kneeled, uh, leaned over to, uh, to Samuel Rance and said to him, uh, What's he doing? And so he says, oh, he's taking up the offering. So Yong Icho sat back in his chair. And then the guy, you know, kept on explaining and talking and talking. Then Yong Icho leaned over one more time and he said, more talk, less money. <laughs> more talk, less money. So I better not say so much on giving, huh? All right. <laughs> Amen. Okay. This morning, we are going to go back into the Gospel of Mark. Is that okay? Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 5, verses 21 onwards. We're going to break it into two portions because it has to do with this person, all right, with Jairus. I want to talk about him for a while. Do we have the scriptures up? Okay. You don't ha I, I can't see it, huh? but it's up here. Okay. Can I see it as well? Can we have the scriptures now? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, everybody ready to read the word? Yes? yes. Oi, why only this side? This side ready to read now? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, let's go. After Jesus returned from across the lake, a huge crowd of people quickly gathered around him on the shoreline. Then, just then, a man saw that it was Jesus, so he pushed through the crowd and threw himself down at his feet. His name was Jairus, a Jewish official who was in charge of the synagogue. He pleaded with Jesus, saying over and over, Please come with me. My little daughter is at the point of death, and she's only 12 years old. Come and lay your hands on her and heal her, and she will live. Jesus went with him, and the huge crowd followed, pressing in on him from all sides. Now we're down to verse 35. 
And before he had finished speaking, this is talking to the woman, all right, who had been a woman with the issue of blood, people arrived from Jairus' house and pushed through the crowd to give Jairus the news. There's no need to trouble the master any longer. Your daughter has died. But Jesus refused to listen to what they were told and said to the Jewish official, Don't yield to fear. Fear not. All you need to do is keep believing. Fear not. Only continue to believe. So they left for his home, but Jesus didn't allow anyone to go with them except Peter and the two brothers, James and John. Next verse. When they arrived at the home of the synagogue ruler, they encountered a noisy uproar among the people, for they were all weeping and wailing. Upon entering the home, Jesus said to them, Why all this grief and weeping? Don't you know the girl is not dead, but merely asleep? Then everyone began to ridicule him and make fun of him, but he threw them all outside. Then he took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and he went into the room where the girl was lying. He tenderly clasped the child's hand in his and said to her in Aramaic, Talitha Kum, which simply means, little girl, wake up from the sleep of death. Instantly, the 12-year-old girl sat up, stood to her feet and started walking around the room Everyone was overcome with astonishment in seeing this miracle. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the word. Now, uh, last week we ended with verse 20, chapter 5 and verse 20, where the man uh, who had been delivered from 6,000 demons uh, has been told by Jesus, no, 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 you don't follow me, but go and tell everybody the good things that God has done for you. So the verse ends by saying that the man went everywhere into the cities, into the ten cities called Decapolis, and told everyone the great things that Jesus had done for him. Now notice, we are so different today. The church is so different today. The moment a person gets saved and all that, then we want to train them, and then the person says, I I want to go and tell people about Jesus. We say, okay, we got to send you to Bible school. And I want you to know, man, Bible school ruins a lot of people. (laughs) It takes the passion out of them, you know. I mean, seriously, it really takes, I mean, they they are there in that school. They got no one to share the gospel with. They are all with theologians all the time, teaching them things about the Bible and about God. When they could actually be experiencing things from the Bible and things from God if they just went out and shared with people. See, that's the way the early church functioned. When people got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, they just went. They didn't say, stay, get trained for three years, and then after that, you can be a preacher. They went preaching everywhere. And if you read the context, uh, verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, it says, everybody began to marvel at the testimony. Now, what's a witness? A witness shares things that they have seen and experienced. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 onwards, it says, That which we have seen, that which we have heard, we declare. Come on, amen. amen. Now you don't know what great preachers you are. You just don't know. Nobody told you you were great preachers. You always think the guy from, uh, behind the pulpit is a preacher. But actually, if you have experienced Jesus, if the Lord has done something good for you, just share that. He's not asking you to preach theology, man. He's not asking you to preach some religion. He's just telling you to share what you have experienced. So when you share what you have experienced, he who has an argument is never, you know, uh, he who has an experience is never at the mercy of him who has an argument. When you have experienced it, you can say, no, you can say whatever you want. I experienced him. And that is the thing that will convince people. Come on, amen. So we talk, the whole gospel is about what Jesus, why did Jesus say that to him? Because he wanted the word to get around that the Messiah had come and that he specializes in changing, transforming people. That it doesn't matter how bad you are, you can have 6,000 demons inside of you. Can you imagine the guy testifying? Huh? I had 6,000 demons, man. Nobody could control me. You put chains on me, I broke those chains. Sleepless nights, screaming, cutting my, I mean, all the stuff. He just shared his testament. This is what happened to me. What was Paul doing? What did Paul do? Same thing. 
I used to hate the church, man. I wanted to kill all those guys. Then one day I'm on my high horse and God knocks me off my high horse, shines his light on me and then he speaks to me. Those guys cannot argue. They say, the only thing they can say is, Paul, I think you, you are mad. <laughs> because nobody experiences things like this. See, the thing about the believer is, the kingdom of heaven has touched their lives. Something from another realm has invaded the earthly realm. That's what Christianity is all about. Come on, amen. amen. You're very quiet. That's what coming to church Sunday after Sunday, Sunday after Sunday does to people. Quiets them. Takes away the fire, man. You experience God, you got to go share with people. Come on. Got to tell somebody. That Jesus is alive. Amen. Look for opportunity. So while Chris uh, went to get a cup of coffee for me when I was visiting with YY at the cafeteria, I tried to get into a conversation with the lady at the side. Hello, how are you doing? See, there's hardly nice people around nowadays. Be nice. Come on, amen. She's sitting there in a wheelchair, leg is in a cast. You know, I didn't get a chance to share the gospel with her, but at least be nice to somebody. Come on, amen. Somebody's concerned, a total stranger asking her what happened. Then she tells me the story. You know, I was sleeping on my bed, my mattress so high, so I rolled over and I fell down and broke my leg. See, it's more dangerous to sleep in bed than ride a motorbike. Mo Moses, correct? Mo Moses? Come on, Moses. <laughs> Darwin, come on. Hear me out. Hear me. Huh? Ride a bike, nothing, man. Lie on a bed, you fall down, break a leg. How bad is that one? <laughs> okay, let's get back to the Bible, Pastor. Okay. Huh? <laughs> Change the bed. All right, so now we're coming into this portion of Scripture. I'm talking about moving from desperation to celebration. We're going to talk about Jairus for a while. Uh, like I'm saying, you know, I, I like this whole thing, understanding this whole thing about the kingdom of God. Because I said... Uh, democracy is actually rebellion against monarchy. Huh? Because we didn't like the kings, so we removed the kings and we put democracy. Uh, it is actually a blessing because, you know, it kind of balances mankind. Right? So no one person is ruling over everybody. But when you have a king who is altogether wonderful, who does not take from you but gives who wants to bless you with all the wealth that he has, who wants to make sure that he becomes a, a, a father to every citizen, makes you co-heirs with his other son, where you share the throne together with him. What a king. Come on, amen. Welcomes you into the throne room. Sit together in, in, with Christ in heavenly places. There's no king who would ever welcome it. anyone. I mean, I think I've watched too many Chinese movies and where you just kill the next in line and all children, grandchildren, everybody in the family, just wipe them all out so that nobody is a threat to your kingdom. That's why we have democracy. People rebelled against that kind of kings. But this king is altogether wonderful. Come on, amen. So Jesus came to show the king. And he says, listen, this king does not have all these rules and regulations. I am the fulfillment of all of it already. And I am here with you. He that has seen me has seen the father. You have seen the king. You have seen what the God is really like. Come on, amen. So he comes in and he introduces this. So we're talking about Jairus. Uh, uh, number one, let's go to the first point. Now, here is a dialogue I wish, I wish I would never have to engage or to endure. Now, the man, we're going to look at his accomplishments. This, this guy is the ruler of the synagogue. Jonathan, can you take this? Please, it's very bright in my eyes. Thank you very much. I don't know how to turn those stuff off. I still use the hard copy. Unlike Pastor Stefan. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to pick on him somewhere down the line. All right. All right. So now here's a pitiful uh, uh, scenario. His accomplishment. This man had prominence. He had position. He had prestige. He had, uh, you know, all 
all the things that you would want to have privileges prosperity power in his community he is a ruler of the synagogue he's a wealthy person he's got servants working for him the man has reached the pinnacle as far as uh, uh, being a success in the world is concerned so with all this prestige and power and all of that he still had a problem and there are certain things that we must understand that man cannot help we must come to a place where we realize this is beyond me that's where God comes into the picture so although he had all his accomplishments there was this acknowledgement that I cannot do with all that I have I cannot help my daughter she's dying she's dying my daughter is dying it's his one and only daughter somehow daughters have a special place in father's hearts all the fathers say amen, amen. <laughs> all right sons we usually say well they can look after themselves no problem you know but daughters we sit around with a shotgun <laughs> all right okay okay so the man has got it all but now he realizes luke's gospel chapter 8 verse 42 says it is his one and only sweetheart the, the translation is his sweetheart and so what happens is he now has to come to a place where he decides all this cannot help me but then his name jairus means the one whom god enlightens so somewhere down the line that's why i said you know i like to meet the mr no name or the miss no name or the mrs no name because these no-name people were the ones who shared with Jairus about Jesus. There are many cases, like the woman with the issue of blood. Who told her that there was power in Jesus? Somebody must have told her. Who told the leper in the leper colony that he would make his way out into the city, risk his life being caught and being killed? Come to Jesus. And you can be totally made whole. Somebody must have told. And that's why I say it is so important for us to tell people what the Lord has done or is doing. If not in you, then what he has done in other people. I sit on a train. I told you the story. I sit on a train with this guy from a religion that we are not supposed to touch. Covered up all over. The, the wife was covered up all over. They are from that country. The other country. And so they are here on a holiday. And I'm sitting next to them. And he wants to get into a debate with me. Why am I a Christian? And so I said, listen, we can, uh, uh, why don't you, you know, favor this religion as well? You know, why don't you study? I said, I've studied all the religions, but I'll tell you why I am who I am. And so I, say, I began to share testimonies, not just my personal testimony. I talk about my sister's mother-in-law who had terminal cancer, uh, a few weeks to live. Doctor said a few more weeks to go, big, huge lump, cancer lump. How she was forced in uh, a total... Uh, refused to believe in Christ she was possessed by demons uh, fight every Christian forced her to get into the stadium where there was a meeting the preacher in the center Yongi Cho said somebody's being healed of cancer and the whole thing disappeared when I shared these things with him he said hold on hold on hold on and he kept his wife kept asking you know different questions so he kept explaining to her He's, at the end of the, the, the train journey, he said to me, I've never heard Christianity shared the way you share it. What was the difference? You can talk about the religion. Listen, we are not here to talk about how good our religion is. We are here to talk about what Jesus has done. What he can do. You know, so and so. If you don't have that kind of a testimony, share about somebody else you have seen. That which we have seen and experienced, we share. Come on, Amen. I mean, when I see somebody else's testimony and their healings and, and people listen to these testimonies, they go, hey, if it can happen to that person, it can happen to me. Come on, amen. amen. So somebody shared about Christ to him. And the man comes believing somehow that Jesus can help him. He comes with the three basic ingredients that makes miracles happen. He comes reverently. It says he comes and he falls at the feet of Jesus. Now I want us to try, try to uh, use our imagination a little bit. Our problem is we see Jesus as we know him now. King of kings, Lord of lords, seated at the throne, all glory. And some of us when we read the Bible, we have this picture of Christ always walking, you know, with glowing light in him. 
He was a carpenter of Nazareth. You know what a carpenter is? Construction worker. Builds houses. That's what he does. That's a carpenter in Bible times. So he was not very clean, was he? In the sense that he didn't have really nice clothes. Ever ready to go help somebody build something. Help somebody with their house. Help somebody with their furniture. Whatever it is. So he's very rough looking. Now I want you to understand that Jesus was not the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, the little sissified guy that's hanging on a cross. That's not Jesus, okay? Yeah, not, not that sissified one. He was strong. He was tough. He was bigger than Jonathan. Not as tall as Arvind, but I mean big, tall, strong, muscular, right? Go up into the hills, go cut wherever he can go, cut wood, bring it all down to help build houses. They didn't have trucks to go up there, electric saws and all that kind of stuff. He just went up, axe man. That's why when he walked into the temple, all those guys were afraid of him. Not because he had some kind of anointing power flowing out of him, he was just tough. Sat down, make a whip. I mean, gangsters in the temple, man. They control the temple. They control everything that was happening there. They, they had their gangs there controlling the mafia. And I want you to know, Jewish mafia can really be Jewish mafia. They are bad guys. So he comes, he can overturn the tables. Each table could put one big bull on top, man. They're not thin kind of tables where you carry, you know, from Ikea. All right? They were hard wooden tape, big tables. And he could, it, it says very clearly, he overthrew. Why does it say that? To show us the strength that he had. Power, man. Come on, amen. Now here's this rough, tough power guy walking with his disciples. And this guy comes, he is the leader of, they, Jews bow down to no one. But here he is, bowing down to this construction worker. Picture that one in your mind. The word for falling down at the feet is to descend. Let me, let me, I wrote it down here. To descend from a higher place to a lower place. It, it is more than just a physical falling down. It is a place where you have really humbled yourself and said, this is beyond me. I've heard so much about you. You've got to do something. See, this is one of the main ingredients to receiving miracles in our lives. When we can really humble ourselves before God. Amen. Humility is a very difficult thing. I'm sure you've heard of the guy who said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so humble to be, you know, I'm so proud to be humble. <laughs> I'm such a humble, I'm just, I'm just so proud I'm humble. <laughs> Humility. Why did the person... Get justified. Jesus talks about the guy who's standing there saying, Lord, and whatever he said was true. I tithe so much every uh, twice a week. I tithe off everything that I have. I fast so many times a week. And he's, he's just saying to God the things that he is doing. Jesus didn't say he's lying. It was the truth. Those were all the things that he was doing. But there was no sense of humility. The other guy would not even lift up his head. And he's saying, oh, be merciful to me. All I know is I need mercy. I know that I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, the guy goes back home happy. Humility releases a lot of blessings. That's why the Bible starts off like this. In, in Chronicles, where it says, If my people who are called by my name, what's the first thing? Shall humble themselves and pray. Amen? They humble them. It, it, God never wants to humble us. Never. He always says, humble yourselves. You humble yourself. Because if God were to humble us, it's bad news already. It's bad. When God has to humble me, it's going to be bad. Okay? You can look at the King Nebuchadnezzar, how God humbled the man, and the man was like a cow outside eating grass for years. So we don't want God. Don't say, oh God, please humble me. Please don't pray that prayer. I don't want to go and have to feed you grass. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> don't say, oh God, you know, please humble me because I'm so proud. <laughs> humble. No, 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 you, you, you humble yourself. Humble yourself. Ask for forgiveness. Humble yourselves. Do things. Serve one another. Don't always have the eye there and everybody must serve you. Humble yourself. Come on, I don't have to go into that. You, you know what I'm talking about. He came reverently. He came prayerfully. I mean, the guy came with a prayer. Notice his prayer is not 15 minutes long. 
His vocabulary was not very good. It's basically, help me, my daughter is dying. So specific, man. Don't beat around the bush going, oh God, you are such a nice God, wonderful God. God who created everything, you who sit on the circle of the earth. And all this stuff, and then finally say, can you give me $100, man? Huh? Get straight to the point. God, I need $100, man. Come on. Get straight to the point with God. Because he knows before we even ask, what he wants is integrity of heart. Not a show, Amen. Prayer is a very, I keep saying this, it's a very simple thing. Sometimes I have to say to God, I don't really know what I need, but I know that I need you. I need you. I know that there's an emptiness that only you can fill. I don't know what that emptiness is, but I know that you are the only one who can fill that emptiness. See, it's a very simple thing. We make it difficult because we think when we hear people's prayers and they talk about spiritual warfare and fighting up there and all these space wars kind of thing, star wars out there, and we listen to all of that and we go, man, I don't know how to pray. How do I battle principalities and powers? Don't battle principalities and powers. Just battle what you're going through. Just get through it. You've got inner problems on your own. Don't worry about Star Wars. Come on, amen. Can I hear an amen? See, a lot of people get very caught up with all of this. You know, going for the seminars where they talk about spiritual warfare. Why do you worry about spiritual warfare, man? Huh? Getting through with your boss is enough. Come on. Living with that husband. <laughs> enough already. You don't need principalities and powers. Huh? Fighting with little decisions that you have to make. Putting food on the table. That's enough. Did Jesus ever go around talking to the, the disciples about spiritual warfare? Show me where. Please. Please. None. Doesn't talk about these things. If there's a demon, cast it out. That's all. Apart from that, don't go and get involved. No, no, we must do. Some people go looking for demons to fight them. Where, where are you? Yeah, I mean, seriously. They won't look. No, they come. I, I went with a group. I mean, it was my first trip to the United States. 40 days we were there. First trip. 40 days with a group of people. And for me, it was the wilderness wandering. Really, it was not going into, going into the promised land. It was wilderness wandering because the group of people. That's why it's so important for you choose the right people when you want to travel. Okay? Don't go with the wrong group. Okay? When we organize a trip, come with us. <laughs> not boring, huh? Yeah, especially with you there, right? Okay. All right, now, listen. <laughs> so... <laughs> And this group, the whole group of them were listening to one of their leaders. One of the guys was their leader basically and I was with another pastor and all that. Both of us were so miserable because wherever they went, we went to the home of this Los Angeles pastor, I mean, uh, associate pastor of a very large church. The church was called Melody Land. The main pastor uh, uh, was a guy called Wilkerson, Ralph Wilkerson, so he's associate. So we went to the home to have food and all of that. Then he shared, he said, you know, you got to pray for us because, you know, my daughter went through a divorce. Immediately the guy went, listen. Did your, your daughter and her husband, when they got married, did they go to Hawaii? Hello? Yeah, yeah, they went to Hawaii. They went to Hawaii. Show me the pictures. So he saw the pictures. This is Hinduism. Because they put garland. See, putting the garlands and all? Hinduism. So you got to break the power of Hinduism. That's why they got divorced, Hinduism. Let me go. And they went through the whole house. The guy had, this is America. Show me an American who does not like horses. And I'll show you a German. No, I mean, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. No, I mean, seriously. Everywhere, horses. Pictures of horses. He had a big, nice horse, man, inside that, uh, his house. Nice, big, you know, carved out horse kind of thing. This one must burn. Because according to the Chinese zodiac, demon, demon, demon. Here, demon. There, demon. Everywhere, demon. I'm thinking, Lord, what's happened? This is the, all, all, the second day, no, 
the third day of our trip. I was thinking, I've got to live with this for another 37 days. Demon here, demon there, demon everywhere. They're binding, binding everything they can bind, man. All right, we get together, all, all hands, all bind, 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 all the time. Bind. Not losing anything. Binding everything. Everything is all bound up. And you look at their faces, very constipated. <laughs> because everything bound one. <laughs> Johnny, you bind everything, how to lose? Everything is bound up, man. No, man. Listen, don't, don't. Wait. Prayer is a wonderful thing. That's why people don't want to pray because they think, see, let me, let me be frank with you, okay? People who like all this binding and casting out demons, now, I believe in casting out demons. If there's someone who's possessed with demons, we'll cast that demon out. But listen to me. People who teach these kind of teachings, they become the person that control your life. They want to control. That's why they say, you know, you're going to come, then let me come to your house, then I will show you what is wrong, what is right. You don't. Until today, some of you never even invite me to your house. <laughs> Maybe I should teach that more than you get invited. <laughs> no, <laughs> kidding, 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 kidding. All right, so prayer is simple. He comes and he just pours out his burden. He pours out his problem. Man, I won't finish this message. What are you all doing to me? He comes reverently. He comes prayerfully. He comes passionately. Man, the guy falls at the feet. He's pleading. Now, this is one of the things we've got to put into our prayer life. We've got to pray with heart, man. You cannot just pray wishful thinking. Many of the prayers are wishful thinking. It's more like, I wish it would happen. Lord, can you please bless me and bless my business? And There's no passion involved. It's not like you're desperate for it. Here is a person in desperation. And this is the kind of desperate I don't want to have to face. I don't want to come to a place where somebody is almost dying. A business is almost failing. Something is almost going to give up. I don't like to come to a place like that. I want it to be thriving from the beginning. That's why I say pray now. Don't wait for it to come to a point where it is almost going. Now, there's a very important scripture many people don't understand. You remember the time where a man comes to Jesus, comes to the disciples, and asks the disciples to cast out a demon from the sun. And they could not do it. Remember the story? So they come to Jesus and they say, this man comes to Jesus and, they, and he says to him, Lord, uh, I brought my son to your disciples. Your disciples could not cast. And this is what happens in church. We bring our son to the church, we bring our daughter to the church, they are not changed. They're still the same. Huh? I brought my husband inside here, I thought he would change, never change, Pastor. So they complain to Jesus. I brought him to church, huh? but that disciple cannot do anything for my husband. You know what? Jesus asked the, asked the man, how long has he been suffering this thing? And we missed the point. The point is, how long have you been living with this problem? You had this all along. You didn't do anything about it when it first started. You allowed it to build up so much so to the place where you cannot handle and then you bring it over to the disciples and you expect the disciples to deal with your problem. Oh, you know, and then a man begins to answer. Then he says, help my unbelief. And Jesus cast out the demon. You following with me? Don't let it build. Right now itself, become passionate about what you, are, what you want God to do for you. Amen? All right. A delay I would not want to face is the second point. Let's go to the second. Which simply means that as he was walking, as they are hurrying to the place, the daughter is about to die. You want the answer to come. And a woman comes and stops him. Somebody jumps the queue. Do you get angry when you're waiting in line? Somebody just come and cut in? Huh? I remember, <laughs> Christoph Blom and myself, we... we going into immigration <laughs> so I'm standing here Christoph is behind me and there's another lady in the front and this guy big guy comes in and he's Russian comes straight in and he just cuts in so nobody's saying anything I go hey excuse me go back in line and the guy goes emergency emergency I said yeah, yeah sure all of us are emergency but get back in line you get upset when somebody jumps queue. Come on. You're driving and somebody cuts into your lane. You forget you're a Christian for a while. Huh? Suddenly, you become, suddenly you become Elijah. 
calling down fire from heaven, right? You're no more Jesus, gentle, meek and mild. You're now, whoo, man, zap the guy. And so here he is. I mean, come on, Jesus, let's go. And this woman jumps the queue, man. She jumps in. And this is something we do not like. We do not like delays. But can I just encourage you? God's delays are not God's denials. Just because he's delaying your answer, wait, man. Huh? Have you ever heard of this word which I don't like? It's called patience. Huh? Come on. It's a fruit of the spirit which uh, is very hard to grow in my life. Other fruit, all okay. Joy, all that, fine. Love is fine. But patience, man. Waiting for it to happen is the worst thing sometimes. Huh? But what does it say in the Bible? It says, uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, I think it says, Tribulation, <laughs> which we don't like, works patience. Suffering going through that period is really suffering. Oh man, now what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And worst of all, it happened. Because he delayed, the daughter died. Makes it even worse. Number three. Let's go to the third one. The deliverance I want to celebrate. Now here is Jesus. Let's watch Jesus. Now I want, I want to close with Jesus because it's good to close with Jesus. As long as Jesus comes on the scene, everything's going to work out. Amen. Amen. Look at the attention he pays to the guy. He comes there and the guy is talking to him. Doesn't tell the guy, stand up. Let me ask you some questions. Nothing. He just keeps silent. He pays attention. When you pray and you are earnest in prayer, his silence does not mean that he's not there. His silence means he's listening. We cannot bear the thought of him. See, because we keep talking in prayer, we believe that Jesus must also keep talking back in return. That's not the way it works. When you talk, he listens. And then when he talks, he expects you to listen. But we don't. We keep on talking. But he's the perfect gentleman. He's not going to interrupt what you are saying. He'll continue to be silent. So the more we talk and the more we talk and the more we talk, the more he will listen. But he will pay attention to you. Gave him his undivided attention. Hurt the man's heart rather than the words. The bleeding heart of a father. And so when the man stood up, he didn't even say a thing. He just grabbed a hold of the man and accompanied him. One of the biggest things that God could do for us is to accompany us. Amen? Give us the attention and then accompany. I want you to know uh, the word where it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have heard this so many times before. The word I will never simply means five times never. I will never, 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 never in the Greek five times. I will never, 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 never. Why does he have to repeat himself so many times? Because we are human. And it's so difficult for us to accept just one never. So he says, I will never ever leave you nor forsake you. I will always be with you. Come on, amen. I will always be with you. I will accompany you. This is the difference in Psalm 115 where it talks about the gods of the world. They have feet, but they walk not. Our God has got feet and he walks with us. Amen? All right, so he, he gives him the attention. So he gets up there, and then as he's going there, there are some sad people from the house that come. Sometimes there are sad people in the house. Have you noticed that? <laughs> huh? They're always sad. Nothing can make them happy, no matter what you do. Uh, please, if you take a trip to the States, don't go with them. All right, let's go. Uh, then there are also some very noisy people in the house, right? <laughs> Wailing, there's a lot of cry, a tumult in the house. Everybody's making a lot of noise. Some people, you know, like I can say, they are, hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Then they go outside, they wallop one another, okay? That kind of people. <laughs> Not really serious about it, okay? Uh, you, you must understand this is an Asian context. In Asian context, when there's a funeral, uh, there are people who are even hired to come and cry. Huh? I think some of the Indian this one, Sister Jibba, have, have you heard this one where people are crying, you know, and they say, oh, did you see the Katri Kaplan outside? Uh, after when we go, oh, yeah, yeah. I said the Katri Kaplan. Yeah, after when we go, we go and pluck and take home. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> did 
They are not really crying. They are crying, but they are talking to one another about what they saw in the house, what's growing outside. Some of you not <laughs> thinking I'm speaking Tamil. No, that was English. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So there are a lot of these people around. But then what he wanted was to enter the room. When you walk into the room, everything changes. So he not just enters the house. He wants to go into the room. And he takes faithful people with him. Amen. He throws out all the unnecessary ones. That's what he does. That's what he says. He says a couple of things. He says to the man, fear not. Do not let fear control your heart. Just continue to believe in me. We are on our way to a miracle. That's the first thing he says to him. Second thing, he, the second statement he makes is, the girl is not dead, she's sleeping. That brings ridicule. Now you have to understand how Jesus sees things and how we see things are two different ways. We look at it as gone, kaput, finish. He looks at it as something that will come alive and be a testimony. You think it's all gone. You think it's all finished. Finish already. Like, cannot already. No point. No point talking already. All gone already. Finish. Might as well shut it down. He doesn't see something as dead. For where he is, there is life. Huh? He's the giver of life. Isn't it? That good. So he throws it all out and then he goes in with some uh, wonderful people. And then he tenderly takes her by the hand. <laughs> So different from today's preachers, huh? In the name of Jesus, come on! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Tenderly takes her by the hand. Just holds her by the hand. And just says, sweetheart. The word Talitha Kumi means, sweetheart, my little lamb, my darling, get up. I was there. Shout and shout and shout. Get up in Jesus' name! Rise in Jesus' name! Talitha, cool. Wake up, little girl. Wake up, my darling. Wake up, sweetheart. And she immediately stands up. He, he speaks with such gentleness. And that gentleness is enough for us. Sometimes we want a loud thunder from heaven. Just listen to his voice. When you read the word of God, may he speak to you gently. And when he speaks, you will have life. Can I hear an Amen. And everyone, it's a reason to celebrate. Everyone in the house were astonished or they all celebrated. From desperation to celebration. So this morning, may God bring you out. If you, if you are really desperate, then you need to know that God wants to bring you out into a place of celebration. Can I hear an amen? Stand with me, please. Hallelujah. Come.